are the three biggest mistakes dads make when talking to their kids about sex? We're going to answer that question coming up. Hey, it's John Finch with The Father Effect. For those of you who may be new to this channel, we have a free 60-minute movie called The Father Effect here on YouTube at a link in the description below. Be sure to check it out. Our goal here on the Father Effect channel is to help fathers become the fathers God created them to be. And my guest today is a guy by the name of Kent Evans. He's the founder of Manhood Journey and Father on Purpose. I love this brother, and every time we have a conversation, I learn something. He has a bunch of sons. I've got a bunch of daughters, so it always makes for an interesting conversation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to support us, there's a link in the description box below. If you know of a dad who needs to hear this conversation about talking to his kids about sex, please make sure you share this video with them. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you'll be notified every week when we release a new video. Without further delay, here's my conversation with Ken Evans. So today we're talking about the top three mistakes that dads make when talking to the kids about sex, man. Let's jump right in. Talk to me. So I was on a call recently. This came out of a call. I've had two calls in the last three weeks with pastors at churches and they had the same basic question. And it was, you know, how do we have these conversations with kids? And they were both asking them for their church, but they were all asking them also as fathers themselves. And I've, I've been talking about this for a couple of years and I'm not the first guy to talk about it, but I think there's three mistakes that we make as dads. I'll list them real quick and then we can dive in one at a time. Number one, we play defense only. We play defense only. Number two, we reduce the purity conversation to just sex, which is a mistake. And the third is we wait too long to have the conversation. And those are the three mistakes I see dads make all the time. And I've made them with my own kids at various stages. I've got boys ages 20 down to age five. So I'm, I'm in the heat of the battle here. I've got five sons. And so I've had these conversations with some of them and I'm about to have them with others. And I've made some of these mistakes and learned the hard way. Well, you know what, too, in one of our conversations previously, this is what I loved. And this is what got me thinking more and more about doing this with you is you talked about, we talked about that sex conversation. And, and this idea, this myth that we as dads think we have to have it all at one time. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, okay, the birds and bees, let's do it. Let's get it in there and out of the way. And that way I never have to have that conversation again. And you had said, no, let's give it in bits and pieces to where there's no pressure. It's not so much stress. It's, it's let's walk them through that process. And I know that may be part of what you're going to talk about. Um, does that, I, and that's what I love about, our initial conversation, even talking about this kind of conversation, it's sex. And so many dads were scared to death. I've got three yeah. daughters. My biggest fear in the world is pregnancy, right? It just is. It just is. And it, it stresses me out all the time, even though I know my girls are good girls. And yeah. but it's that fear yeah. they're going to buy into anything or get caught up in the moment, the temptation. It just drives me nuts. Well, let's go backward through these three items because you've hit on the, this is the third one and it's that we wait too long. And the reason we wait too long <clears throat> is two, two reasons for that. Number one, we think that we've got to have every perfect answer and be all ready for every possibility that can come up. And the second is we think we have a lot of time, but we don't. Hey, look, man, if your kid's 10 or 11, he or she's about to be exposed to something that's of some kind of sexual nature that you can't control. And I don't care how sheltered you try to make them they're going to get exposed to something. It could be an ad in an NFL game. It could be a kid saying something at this neighborhood swimming pool. Doesn't matter. Something is going to come up. And so here's the deal. The deal is if you're tempted to wait too long, here's the antidote to that problem. Just begin the conversation. I get really, really frustrated when I hear guys talk about the sex talk. All it demonstrates is you don't know what in the world you're talking about. It's a eight or nine year conversation that you should have with your children that just has a beginning point, a beginning point. What's the beginning point? It doesn't really matter. I mean, you could start with, Hey man, don't trust that stranger, that strange guy. Don't, don't go on internet chat rooms. You could start with the birds and the bees of how babies are made. It could start with images that you should or shouldn't be looking at. Just get the conversation 
started and let it unfold over the course of their like early preteen and teenage years so that you don't feel like you got to cover it all in two hours. Cause here's the deal. Even if you could have a perfect two hour conversation, how much of that are you going to remember? Or is your child going to remember? I mean, you and I, we've sat through sessions and seminars and you bet you got to give it to them in bits and pieces. And you got to give them some bits now, some bits later, some bits will make more sense when they have more temptation or when they have more exposure. It's going to have a little, make a little more sense over time. And so dads, we just got to get the conversation started. Don't fall into this third trap of waiting too long. Well, so to that point, let me ask you, because even this piece, the keeping it simple piece, I think is still intimidating for a lot of guys, whether they're talking to boys or girls wow, how do I even begin that? Like, uh, we're riding in the car and it's like, hey, Jimmy, been thinking about sex I lately? Just, <laughs> I can just, I've, I've had three boys. I, so my boys are 20, 18, 16, and then nine and five. So I haven't had conversations with my nine and five-year-old on these topics yet. But in a sense, in a sense, even with my nine-year-old, we st- we, he knows body parts that are off limits right? He knows that he shouldn't pull his pants down in public. He knows that girls have body parts, top and bottom, that are not okay for you to know about. Well, why why have we started talking about that at such a young age? Because I'm planting seeds for these conversations to come to fruition later. And so for me, for the dad who says, man, I don't even know where to start. um, I have a good message for you, right? Too bad, right? Your, Your job is to start. I don't care if you are intimidated, scared, uncertain, your dad didn't talk to you, get over it. Because here's the deal. If you don't start soon, somebody else will. And the, the, the danger of that is if I, I once took a guy who was from the country of France to a Washington Nationals baseball game. Uh, he had never seen an American baseball game. And by the way, if you try to explain the game of baseball to a guy from Europe, it's the dumbest sport in the world. I mean, they're like, why are guys going to that base and not that one? And do they get a point every time they touch a base? And oh my word, it's a dumb sport really to explain to someone from outside America. But you know what? For about two hours, you know what I was to him? The world's foremost authority on the sport of baseball. You know why? Because I was sitting there explaining it to him. Whether I was telling him the right thing or the wrong thing, didn't quite matter. Point was, he had no other resource to contradict what I was saying. And so, dads, where you begin is begin. It doesn't matter. And I'll tell you how I began. This is just from the Kent's kind of playbook. I would go find something we could be doing, whether it's uh, walking through the neighborhood or uh, hanging out, shooting hoops or something like that. And I might just say, hey, Alex, what do you think the word sexy means? Because they've heard that word in popular culture. They've heard that word, whether it's on an NFL game or they've seen it on a, on, a, on a movie trailer. They've heard that word. They've seen it written. And they go, I don't know. It has something to do with women. And I go, yeah, exactly. Do you know where that word comes from? No, I guess not. Well, the word sex, you know what that means? And they would go, nah, no idea. And I would go, well, guess what? And then I prefer, I prefer, John, to use anatomically correct words for the body parts we're going to talk about. I don't go wee wee and pee pee and dee dee and mimi and all that stuff is ridiculous. And it, it puts sex in this conversation. That's like silly and funny. And guys just say, look, man, here's what happens when dad and mom are alone. A really fun activity we get to do together is I know this sounds crazy, but when, and then you describe, I described the process (laughs) and my boys were like, are you serious? And at first they're kind of like, no way. (laughs) And it's a little more like gross and freaky. And then I just leave it like in my head, there's a timer running and it's set for about 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. And I want the conversation to stop. I intentionally want the conversation to stop. You know why? That first moment of them going, wow, mom and dad do this together. That's crazy. I just need that to soak in for a week or two or a month. And then I'll come back and I'll have little milestones along the way for about six months. And I want to have those initial conversations. Mom and dad do it. It was God's idea to begin with. It's actually quite a lot of fun. 
And if you hang tight and wait till marriage, that's the best opportunity. That's what I like to start with. People can challenge that. There's lots of ways to come at it. Point is, it's a big round room, lots of doors that come into it. Pick your door. I chose to pick the door of sexy, sex, how the thing works, how babies are made, and then I want to get off of the conversation. Later, we'll come back into like pornography, masturbation, other things. We'll get on those topics, but not right in the initial moment. I'm not trying to give them a PhD in every possible deviant version of this activity. Come on. I just want to get the conversation started. And you know what? I love that. So I remember with my girls, uh, when they got to a certain age, and I want to say it was that, yeah, like 11, 12. And, and, and you know, I've got girls, maturity levels were my oldest one, her maturity level is, well, she was, you know, she was a little older than her age, most of her life has been, right? And you have others that are, you know, right in that age, they're age appropriate, whatever. But I remember having conversation with each one of them. And, and it was one of those date nights, just me and them, just hanging out. And, and I just, I just said, Hey, I, I love you. I care about you. And, and just speaking that life and love into them. And then just saying, you know, here's one thing I want to talk about. And just, just we'll continue to have this conversation. But, but my expectation for sex, and especially I think for, for, for fathers with daughters and sons, it's here's my expectation. And so that they know and see that right away. And that gets, I think, burned into their brain of, okay, here's dad's expectation. And I want to do the best I can. And I learned this from Dr. Meeker when we did the movie. She said if a dad will do that, especially with a daughter, that it decreases her chances of having sex significantly. If dad just kind of sets that bar, sets that expectation. Yeah. And, and so that's for me, that was a big part of me wanting to have that conversation. And with dads and daughters, it's, it is still a little uncomfortable for a lot of dads <laughs> because our daughters are the opposite sex. With dads and sons, I can imagine it comes maybe a little more naturally in some instances. But, dude, I love that. I, I love the idea of a conversation starter. Well, and the second mistake we make is we reduce <clears throat> God's teaching on purity down to just sex. So, for example, if I were to stand up in front of a group of high school students and say, hey, what's purity mean? They're going to go, don't look at internet porn. Don't have sex before you're married. All right. What else? Uh, is there something else? <laughs> and you go, oh, wait a minute. So I think of like 2 Timothy 2, 21. It says, those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. He's talking about vessels of gold and silver, and he's talking about the idea of purity. Well, the topic of purity biblically is much broader than sexual purity. So what we want to do is we want to frame our conversations with our children in light of God's commandments and God's perspective. So I want my kids to realize that sexual purity is a form of purity, but there's financial purity. There's motivational purity. There's behavioral purity that have everything to do with how we treat other people, how we go to work every day, how we handle our money. So this idea of purity, the second mistake we tend to make as dads is we reduce purity down to just the sex conversation. I think that's a big mistake, man. God wants us to be sanctified, purified vessels, useful for work. And if we can see, man, I really want to walk humbly, walk in a pure way, well, we have sex in its correct context. And it's in its correct context is I want to be a vessel prepared well for God's use. And I can only do that if my life smacks of purity in every area. And so I like to frame it in that context so we don't, we don't downgrade the idea of biblical purity just into the topic of sex. So those are two of the big three mistakes I see dads make. Well, and, and even that I think is a great conversation starter. Even the idea of just talking about purity and then how that can then follow with all of the various forms of that, but then getting to the sexual purity, dude, that, that's, that's, that's gold because that, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that I think most of us as dads aren't thinking about. And it's such a great transition into, it's not like the kids sitting there going, Oh, dad just dropped a sex bomb on me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, they're not going to connect the dots in a lot of cases that he was yeah, moving. Exactly. You know, he's a little smarter than I am. Exactly. Okay. Third thing. The third thing is, and we talked about it in the beginning is we play defense only. <clears throat> And um, when we think of purity, we think of don't 
don't, 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 right? No internet, uh, unfiltered internet. We, so we put internet filters on our kids' device and we, we guard them from the big, bad, evil internet, which granted is a big, bad, evil place in many ways. We no TV in your bedroom. Uh, you charge your iPhone on the common table out in the kitchen when you, we lock down the computer. And so basically what we're teaching them when we do this is we're teaching them that sex and purity and this is like some dangerous, scary place and it's going to like attack you and kill you. Well, as parents, we know the dangers of illicit sexual activity. Probably some of us have experienced them ourselves and have the guilt and shame connected to those years of our lives. And so we do want to keep them away. It's like if you caught your hand in a bear trap, you don't want to see how close you can get to it. You want to stay as far away from it as you can. But what we have to do as parents is we've got to play a lot of offense. We have to have a good offense. The, the scripture that could, should come to mind is Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? How can we live according to something we have never ever read or understood? So for me, for me, my greatest, greatest weapon in this over-sexualized, over-sexualized culture, instant access to porn from any angle, my greatest weapon is God's word. It's not covenant eyes, even though I love covenant eyes. It's not time limits on the phone. It's not accountability. It's none of that junk, man. It is God's word embedded in their heart. Because guess what? The day is coming when I can't control my kids' defenses. Whether it's at college or when they're in their 20s, there is at some point coming a day and for most of us, I heard a guy one time say, man, my son is nine years old. I've, I've, I've only got half my time left with him. And I said, can I help you with that? And he said, sure. And I said, you have 25% of your time left. And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, the next nine years, he's going to get a job. He's going to get a car. He's going to have school. He's going to have friends. He's going to have other things. You've already burned through 50% of your discipleship time at age nine. Welcome to the party, my friend. And he was like, wow, freaking out. But here's the thing, there's a time coming sooner than we'd all like <clears throat> that our kids are gonna have to have a filter that they live life through. Man, it better be God's word. It better be God's word. So we've got to play a tremendous amount of offense. That's God's word, that's healthy music, that's good friends. There's lots of things we can put around them that are good. I remember when my, boy, my boys were younger, in fact, my oldest son, Alex, who a, was a, a, a musical, you know, not a savant, but he's really talented. He caught on quick to music. He would spend hours and hours practicing. Um, and I, I mean, most of your listeners and watchers are probably too young to remember uh, the, the old North Carolina coach was a Dean Smith who first ran the four corners offense. Mm. So he would stall at the end of the game. This is before a shot clock in the 1980s. And he would just pass the ball around in four corners and run the clock out. If your kid has a good, healthy habit, right? They love gardening. They love music. They love skateboarding, whatever the habit might be. Dude, man, I shoved my son at guitar practice. Loved it, man. I was running out the clock. I was running out the clock. I was burning his mental energy and his excitement and passion in an area where, go figure, now today he's studying to be a musician and a worship pastor. You know, God only can work all this out. So at the end of the day, we've got to play offense. And that's shoving our children at positive things and not just having them be recoiled from negative things. And the number one positive thing we can shove them at is God's word, straight and simple. Well, and I think to this point, and this is why I love this conversation, there's two things to unpack there, dive even deeper into. And the first is this, it's, it's our own past experience shame, guilt, all this stuff. In the way that we were raised, it becomes this generational thing, right? Talking about fathers. It's, I think a lot of us, you said it, play defense. We act from a defensive nature because maybe we grew up, I grew up Southern Baptist and it was like, dude, you didn't talk about sex. I mean, my mom has said many times that generation didn't tell their kids about sex. My mom didn't talk to me about sex and I didn't have a dad, right? So I'm trying to learn it from wherever, but it's, it's our own past experience, which, which really warps our own sense and view towards sex, which then affects the way we then communicate that to our kids, right? So we've got to rethink that in a healthy way and not, not take all that baggage on 
as we have these conversations with our kids, right? Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is <clears throat> if you and I, if you and I are walking through the mall and there's a store and, and the store has like blacked out windows and a door and you can't see what's inside the store. You don't know what's in it. There's no label. <clears throat> and every time you and I walk past that store, I go, oh, hey, hey, John, stay away from that store. Well, okay. You know, when you're five or eight or nine, you just stay away. You don't even ask. When you're 10 or 11, you kind of go, huh, I wonder why dad keeps telling me to stay away from that store. You might be bold enough to ask me at some point, you know, Kent, we walked by that store a hundred times. Why do you keep, John, I'm telling you, that store is bad. You stay away from that. That's the posture many of us accidentally, I mean, accidentally take when it comes to sex. It's frightening, dangerous, scary, illicit, evil. Just stay away. Oh my goodness. I don't know about you, okay, but I'm just going to say this out loud. I think sex is one of the coolest gifts ever given to mankind in the context of a faithful marriage. It's fantastic. Amen, so why brother. Would I spend, why would I spend 18 years telling my son it's this really bad, evil thing? Because for a time, it is very destructive and evil. But past a certain point, it's one of the coolest things ever. So then we can have the conversation about, hey, man, let me tell you about something you're going to get when you get married. That's one of the coolest things ever. And, and sex becomes this conversation of like a gift <clears throat> we get to open from God after a certain date. So it's just kind of like money in a sense, John, right? Is it's not money isn't good or bad, but what we do with it is good or bad. Well, sex isn't good or bad. It's where does it happen? Does it happen in the confines of a faithful, trusting marriage between a man and a woman forever? It's the best thing ever. Does it happen outside of that? Oh, man, that's destructive and, and evil. Okay, well, we can't just tell our kids, that's a bad place. Don't ever go in. No, man, it's a great place. It's like flowing with milk and honey, right? It's great after a certain point. And we just got to be able to frame the conversation up on the terms of time and marriage and then we unlock all kinds of great conversations about sex. I'll tell you a funny story one time. So the way, if you could come to my house, you could see, when you walk into my main bedroom, <clears throat> I've got the bedroom, and then off to the side, we have a little bathroom. And one night, my son walked up to the bedroom door, and he didn't know my wife, this is my oldest son, who's now 20, back when he was about 15, he didn't know my wife was in the bathroom, because from the hallway, you can't see the bathroom. And so he, he just stuck his head in my door, and he just goes, hey, dad, I have a question about sex. I said, all right, shoot. He goes, how often do you and mom do it? <laughs> and what was really funny. Is She's listening moment, to this. Yeah. At that moment, you could hear my wife go. <laughs> and she starts laughing from the bathroom. And then he pokes his head around and goes, oh, I didn't know mom was here. And I said, well, why don't you ask her while you're, while you're here? And it, it just became this, <laughs> this funny. And here's the thing, though, right? Here's the thing. What I was trying to do, what I was trying to do, is make conversations about sex fun, pleasant, informative, non-defensive, even somewhat entertaining. You can laugh about it and drain all the pressure and the tension out of that subject in my house. Because listen, man, I'm trying to play chess and not checkers. The game I'm trying to play is, do my boys come to me with those questions? That's actually the game I'm trying to play. Not do I have every answer right and do I agree with everything John Finch says or Max Lucado says or my pastor says or, you know, uh, Stephen Covey said or James Dobson said. It's not about that. The question is, am I the place that in their teen years, they bring questions about sex? And for sons, I want to be that guy. For daughters, we may want it to be our wives. But man, I sure want it to be one of us, right? If you're married and you got a wife in the picture, you know, you may not, you may be divorced or separated or your wife, you'd be a widow or widower, but man, it's a huge win if your kids are bringing you those questions. And if your immediate reaction is to go, oh, whoa, what kind of question? And, oh, wait, why are you asking that? Did you have it last night? What are you doing? Whoa, 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 chill, chill. You've already won. You've already won. Yeah. And this is what I think too, the, the second part of that and not playing defense. And this is what I love. My wife does such a great job with our girls and things that, that coming up, whether it's 
getting pics on their phone from random guys, which happens. It's just, it blows me away. And just, it's crazy to me. But she really does a great job of, of helping them process that, helping them, even with other girl drama. It's, okay, mom, what should I send back? How should I frame this? What should I say in the text? So she does such a great job, and because she's female, and, you know, so it just works out. And I'm able to get in on some of those conversations from time to time, but they really look to mom to that because of they're trying to figure out their way into womanhood and how all that comes together. So I know from, you know, I, and I see that, and I love it because they're coming to her. You know, they've come to her at all different ages going, hey, mom, I got this text from so-and-so. She's causing all this drama. How should I respond? So I'm sure it's the same way with the guys, but it's, it's like you said, they're coming to mom or dad to say, hey, how do I process? How do I work through this? Coach me through it, right? And the fact that they're willing to do that says so much. And that's what I love about it. And that's why I encourage dads. I know it's uncomfortable. I'm, <laughs> I'm in those conversations. I've had my sons ask me about pornography, masturbation, um, uh, homosexuality. I've had all these conversa conversations. <laughs> Conversexualizations. <laughs> what? A little, little Freudian what? slip right there. I've had all these conversations. And I would not say uh, that any of them are like comfortable, you know, or, or fun. But if, if as a dad, if as a dad, we only do the comfortable, we put our kids at risk, right? We put our kids at risk. Uh, just like it may be uncomfortable for you to talk to your kids about managing your money when you went bankrupt once upon a time or whatever. But here's the deal, man. There's a fruit on the other side of that, right? I just, just yesterday, yeah, yesterday, my 18 year old son said, hey dad, can I ask you a question? It had nothing to do with sex, but it had to do with uh, temptation of a different kind and thoughts and spiritual kind of warfare. And just the whole time we were talking, I was like, thanking God that he asked me that question. Now, I'm not sure I got the answer exactly right. You know, I'm not even sweating all that. I'm just saying, I knew that by the, as soon as he asked me the question, I was already standing on third base. You, you know what I'm saying? I was so far ahead because the fact that I'm seen as a resource for matters of import for my children, that's where I want to be with an 18 year old kid. And so I, we, we're going to earn that right. We're going to earn that right when we do the uncomfortable thing, when we do the uncomfortable thing. And for us, man, if you have kids who are 10, 11, 12, and you haven't started this conversation, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying somebody else has probably already started this conversation with them. And whether you like it or not, um, now's probably the time to dive in. And you know what, too, I think we a wrap up here. I, I, I'm a big, and I've learned this through the years, I'm a big proponent of being able to be, be authentic and real with our kids and share some of my own story. So even this could be a piece of that transition or icebreaker. It's sharing some of your own story of growing up. Maybe the first time you learned about yeah. sex, right? And, well, and even, it, here's the encouragement I want to give dads. <clears throat> uh, and, and I hope that, that this um, encourages the dad because really what I'm trying to do with my children is I want them to know, I want them to know God's word and I want them to be able to apply it to their life. So when I'm talking to them about any topic, right? Uh, spiritual warfare, money management, anger management, sex, lust, whatever the topic is. I am not speaking from my own authority or perfection. Like here's what Satan wants to do. What Satan wants to do is say, you know what, Kent, remember what you did when you were 17? Okay, then you're out. You, you have no right to talk to your, you know what I do when those things happen, John? I just agree with Satan. <laughs> you know what? As a matter of fact, Satan, you're right. I don't. However, however, God does. And he's given me his word that I can give to my kids. So for the dad who says to himself, I don't know what I would say to my kids since I failed. And you know what you have? You have a pride problem. Because you know the center of that issue is you. You are not the center of the universe and you are not the center of the teaching on sex. You didn't invent sex. It wasn't your idea. It's God's idea. He invented it. Just pass along what he said. Pass along what he said. And then to your point, at some point in their journey, you can share your personal story. 
But if all we teach from is our own personal experience, good grief, man. We're setting our kids up for failure because I am an abject failure. I just happen to be 50 years old. I've been failed over and over. I don't teach from my own perfection. I teach from God's perfect word. I teach it imperfectly, but that's my job. And I'm okay with all the gaps there, man. And that's what grace is for. Grace covers through all that stuff, man, because I am not going to get it perfectly right. And any dad listening to this, man, you are not going to get it perfectly right. But if you just begin, I promise you'll like the fruit on the other side of that. Dude, I love it. And, and you know, one of my life verses in this whole journey I've been on is in, in Romans 8, 1, when it says there's no condemnation for those that belong to Jesus Christ. And, and that's something that's of life verse to me because of the unworthiness and shame and all the junk, right? <clears throat> from the past and, and and specifically i think as it relates to porn the shame the guilt you know premarital sex whatever however you may have jacked up and screwed up and did it wrong it's it's in remembering that verse man there is no condemnation because i think that attack the spiritual warfare that dude i have to remind myself of that verse all the time oh, man, <laughs> man I, I in fact last year one of my goals was to memorize eight, Romans 8, 1 through 17. And I got pretty close. I got about 85%. Um, and I, I just kept saying that over and over again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Set us free. We didn't set us free. Kent and John didn't set us free. Christ Jesus set us free. And I just want to share that with my kids. You know, it's like introducing them to a rich guy. <laughs> it's like, hey, he's got a lot of money. Go over there and get his money. Uh, I don't have the money. He's got the money. And so that's the idea. Are we connecting our kids? And I see a lot of dads trying to parent out of their own perfection. And it's exhausting. Good gravy. Man, it's Can't be done. And, yeah. Nah, it's just a trick Satan plays on us. And, and we know his schemes. We'll get past it. Hey, don't forget to check out the Father Effect Show, where I have been able to interview some fascinating people with great advice and stories about how to be a better father. Remember, your life is your legacy, and what you do and say every day is impacting your family and generations to come. See you next time on The Father Effect Show.